I do want to thank uh, Pam, first and foremost, uh, David, Jane, and everyone else who put this together. Um, frankly, looking over the program, it was truly remarkable, the, the talent that we have here. I know most of you by reputation, but I've met very few of you in person, and so I really look forward to getting to know you over the next uh, few days that we're together. So um, my talk will be, up, be about early media and the developing mind. I should start by saying that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And my laboratory uh, at Seattle Children's Research Institute focuses specifically on determining modifiable factors in children's early environment that can positively impact their cognitive, social, and emotional development, and to develop actionable strategies to optimize them. And clearly, as all of you know, one of those enormous influences is uh, media. But today I'm gonna focus of all of these things on the, on the effects on children's cognition, mostly because Pam only left me three hours for this morning's talk, so I don't have enough time to cover the rest. I wanna start by framing it that there are three concurrent phenomenon of early childhood. The first is brain growth, the second is executive function development, and the third is media exposure. And I wanna talk about the confluence of those and why uh, I think the implications are profound. So starting first with brain growth, um, the newborn brain, the typical newborn brain is 333 grams, and it triples in size in the first two years of life. It's an extraordinary period of brain growth, in fact, unparalleled over the lifespan. And you can see that here, you can see just how steep the rise is early. And in fact, as we'll, I'm sure, be revisiting over the course of these next few days, brain growth isn't really fully developed until the late teens, early 20s. And then you can find yourselves over here and see why you had such a hard time finding your card keys this morning. But, <laughs> but we'll be, I'll be focusing anyway on this very, very early period because that's where my research is focused. Now, we're born with a lifetime supply of neurons, of brain cells, um, and that's not where brain growth occurs. It occurs through the synaptic connections between those neurons, uh, which begin very early in life. If you will, the mind is fine-tuned to the world that children inhabit. And to give you an example of that that everybody can relate to, any child born anywhere in the world can learn to speak any language fluently. But if they're not exposed to certain sounds early in life, they can learn to speak another language later, but they'll never sound like a native speaker. So to, to put a context to that, a child born in mainland China can learn to speak fluent Mandarin, as amazing as it is to me, because it's such an incredibly hard language. But if she doesn't hear English sounds, let's say, early in life, in the first three to five years, she can learn to speak English later, but she'll never be able to roll her R's. We all know such people. It's not because they weren't born with that capacity, it's because their mind tuned itself to a world in which that sound doesn't exist during that critical window and that opportunity was then forever lost. And you can see this schematically here. At birth, each of our brain cells has about 1,500 connections with other brain cells. By three years of life, it's about 25,000. And then gradually, over the course of the developing period, uh, connections are pruned. Those that aren't enhanced go away. Uh, and this, if you will, is how the architecture of the brain is developed early on. Now I show you this, this is the breathing, of a one, breathing pattern of a one day old infant listening to music. And you can see here that Mozart is playing, and then Stravinsky comes on, and then Mozart again. Now I show you this not to present some kind of an infantile critique of classical music, <laughs> but perhaps those of you that know something about it might have a hypothesis for why Stravinsky did this to this poor baby's breathing. <laughs> but, but I show you this to show that there's a discernible physiologic reaction even at one day of life, to what babies are hearing. They already are making connections, making distinctions uh, between, between different types of music. Now, how does a brain develop? Uh, in medical terms, it, it's caudal to ventral. This is the back of the brain, this is the front. If someone could click on this movie, since I don't have the ability to do that, you'll see as it starts to turn blue, here we go, from the back, all the way to the front. And this here is the prefrontal cortex. It's the last part of the brain to develop, as I showed you in the previous slide, not till about 19 to 20 years of age. Uh, this is the executive center of the brain. But to put it schematically, we're born with the following in the back, the following functions main, mainly maintained by the, the, the caudal part of the brain. So babies have vital functions. They have smooth mo movement coordination. They have audio and visual processing. 
By about four months of age, they begin sensory motor integration and in inhibition of primitive reflexes. At about 10 to 12 months, they begin to have their limbic system develop, which is deep in here, and that's what controls emotions. This is why six-month-olds can't have temper tantrums, but 10-month-olds can have very, very good ones, 16-month-olds even better. At about 18 to 24 months of age, uh, in the temporal lobe, processing of sound and language develops, and that's when we see an explosion in children's use of language. And then finally, uh, from early childhood to late adult, uh, early adulthood, we have the prefrontal cortex, which controls abstract thought, reasoning, judgment, and regulation of emotion. And the fact that this is the last part of the brain to develop, as I'm sure those of you who study adolescents or have them, speaks volumes for why adolescents can be such a challenge, because they, they lack, if you will, the, 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 the executive function to, main, to, to control the emotions that are raging at that point in their lives. So moving on to discuss executive function, the second of the three phenomenon. Now there are three components to executive function. The first is self-control, so defined as the ability to stay focused and resist temptation, as this cute little girl is doing there. The second is working memory, the ability to hold information in your mind while mentally working with it. And the third is cognitive flexibility, which is the ability to apply something learned in one context to another and modify it accordingly. So it's executive function that prevents you from jumping to the wrong answer here. Uh, you have to have enough attention, enough focus to not jump to the easy, albeit humorous answer that's clearly incorrect. Some of you may be familiar with the Stanford Marshmallow Test. It was very cute, done, I guess, we're in California, but not actually in Palo Alto, um, that, uh, that was done with, 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 ch with children in the Stanford preschool. So quite simply, the researchers brought these children in. They were preschool children, three to five years of age, sat them in a room, told them they could have one marshmallow now, or if they waited 10 minutes, they could have two, and they left the room and videotaped them. Only about 20 to 30 percent of the kids were able to wait the entire time, uh, and they employed all kinds of tactics to try to to, to delay the gratification. Some of them would look away, some of them would bite their fingers, some of them would take a little pinch of it and then try to cover it up. Um, <laughs> but the fascinating thing was the longer they waited, uh, the better these kids did. The better they did in preschool, the better they did in high school, the better they did in life when they were followed 25 years later. So this, if you will, is a measure of executive function. And it's a pretty simplistic one, but this idea of being able to focus on the prize Focus on the two marshmallows I'm going to get 10 minutes from now and not jump to the impulse to eat this marshmallow now. Now Moffitt uh, and colleagues did a much more sophisticated study using the Dunedin longitudinal data, which many of you may be familiar with. They followed 1,000 children from birth to age 30. It's an observational study, but it's extremely well controlled and with excellent follow-up. And I'll show you briefly just a few of the things they looked at but, uh, in terms of outcomes. But what you see here is child self-control in quintiles, low to high. And I only put three up here because the slide gets very, very busy. But you'll notice that as self-control in childhood improves, adult outcomes, whether it's SES, poor physical health, or substance dependence, also improve. So 30 years later, how well controlled you were as a child makes an enormous difference. And I, I can refer you to the paper, but they looked at 20 outcomes, and they all had the same relationships with the same directionality. Now this is a graphic showing executive function development, and again you'll see that there's a very, very steep rise early in life, uh, meaning that this is, a, this, is a this is foundational time for developing this executive function. It's a critical period. And there are many things that we know you can do to try to promote it. So this is from Habits of the Habits of the Mind curriculum. It's a very simple game. It's called Walk the Line. You can do it with preschool kids. You take a piece of tape, you put it down, and you ask the child to put one foot in front of the other and walk along it as he's doing. But doing that actually does require a fair amount of executive function. You have to not be distracted. You have to stay focused on the line in front of you. And of course, you can make the line progressively longer, more difficult, more challenging. And, and children will be able to, much the same way as they progress with exercise, get better at this uh, over time. And the thinking is that by doing that, you can prevent the child from eating the marshmallow. They can use these skills in other arenas. The third phenomenon I want to talk about is media exposure, uh, which everybody here obviously knows about or you wouldn't be here. Um, it says, go to your chat room. 
we are uh, technologizing childhood, as you know, in a way that's really incredible, uh, unparalleled. In 1970, the average age at which children began to watch television was four years of age. And today, uh, based on research that we've done, and others have done, it's about four months of age. So there's been a dramatic shift in the age at which children begin to interact with screens. And most of the shift has not happened over the last 40 years. Most of it has actually happened over the last 15. It's not just the age at which they begin. It's the amount of video and media consumption. So if you look here, children 0 to 6 spend about two hours a day with screens. Children 8 to 18 spend about five and a half hours a day. Don't ask me how much time seven-year-olds spend. I didn't collect these data. Actually, Vicki Rideout did, so she, you can ask her why seven-year-olds were not included. Um, but that's based on TV viewing in the home, and as we know, most children are also cared for outside of the home. And a few years ago, we did a study to look at TV exposure in childcare settings. And you can see that children in home-based settings watch about an extra hour and 20 minutes a day. Children in center-based uh, settings watch considerably less. But if you total it all together, the typical preschool child today in the United States spent about four and a half hours uh, in front of a TV or a screen of some kind, and they're only awake for about 12. So they're spending about 30% of their waking hours in front of a screen of some sort. So what can I say about these three concurrent phenomenon that are uh, occurring early in childhood? Well, we know from uh, decades of observational research that too little stimulation is very, very bad for brain development. These are two PET scans. Uh, the one on the left is of a normal kindergartner. And for those of you that aren't familiar with PET scans, uh, they're a measure of brain activity. And the brighter areas are, uh, more, are more active. And on the right here is a PET scan of a child that was brought up in a profoundly neglected environment. It's actually one of the Romanian orphans some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and you can see there are areas of this child's brain at kindergarten that are fully undeveloped as a result of complete understimulation. Uh, again, that early period that determines the architecture of the brain resulted in profound deficits for this child. So too little stimulation is bad, but the question that we've had in my lab for some time now is what about too much? Is it possible to overstimulate the developing brain? Or if you will, is it possible to inappropriately stimulate the developing brain? Is there good stimulation and bad stimulation? What defines it and how much of it is best for brain development? Which brings us to baby Einstein. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen it. This is baby Einstein. Uh, there, there's a whole series of them, obviously. And there are many other videos that are designed specifically for young children. But this is a random 20-second clip from baby Einstein's day on the farm. So in that 20-second clip, there were seven scene changes. It's the most exhausting day on the farm since John Steinbeck's Grapes of Rap. <laughs> and, 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 and more to the point, it's, it's entirely random. As adults watching this, your brain is trying to make a coherent narrative out of it, but you can't. It's completely discombobulated. Uh, there is no sense to be made of it. Babies watching it, of course, aren't able to engage it in that cognitive way. They're not trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. What's keeping them engaged in the screen is all of that screen change. So where does that lead us? Well, I want to talk about ADHD, which is, frankly, a deficit in executive function. That's exactly what it is. Um, it's characterized by impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity. It currently affects about 10% of US children. And it's 30% more common today than 20 years ago. And we've known for some time that there's a genetic basis for ADHD. I've summarized here about 20 studies that have looked at the heritability. And if you put them all together, the heritability is about 75%, meaning that if one identical twin has ADHD, there's a 75% chance that her sibling will. So it's not entirely genetic. If it were, it should have been 100%. And in fact, like most things, we've now come to believe that there's a gene environmental interaction that produces the phenotype that we see. And there are many candidate genes that have been identified, many, many environmental uh, exposures that have been explored, and the question is, could overstimulation through media be another one? The Surgeon General in, in himself in 1999 said, for most children with ADHD, the overall effects of these gene abnormalities appear small, suggesting that non-genetic factors also are important. Now, I want to 
step back for a minute because I talked about ADHD to set this up, but I actually, um, I think ADHD is a, is a, does a disservice to children as a diagnosis. And here's why. If you, think of, of, if you think of attentional capacity as having a normal distribution, which it surely does, what we do as clinicians, speaking now as a pediatrician, as we do with many things, is we draw a line here somewhere, typically the 95th percentile, and we say, if you're on this side of the line, you have a pathology, in this case, ADHD, and we label you, we medicate you, we change your environment, we do all kinds of things for you. But on this side, there's clearly a child that has attentional problems, for which we say to the parent, great, you're very lucky, your child doesn't have ADHD, go back home and, <laughs> and deal with them. And if you remember the slide I showed you about executive function and adult outcomes, there's no threshold. There is absolutely no clinical threshold. Better self-control, better executive function has a linear relationship with outcomes. And so, in fact, the child, that's dying, the child that's on this side of the line that we've drawn would paradoxically be better served if they scored one point worse or two point worse on their Vanderbilt screen and then got the services and the attention that come with that diagnosis. And it shouldn't be that way. So our job is to try to help every child maximize uh, their attentional capacity. And in my lab, we focus specifically on that, on executive function without any dichotomies. So that said, uh, the overstimulation hypothesis, as we call it, uh, is stated as follows, that prolonged exposure to this rapid image change during a critical period of brain development preconditions the mind to expect a high level of, uh, of stimulation of input, and that leads to inattention in later life. So put another way, you watch, another, you watch enough baby Einstein day on the farm as a baby, and then when you go to a farm as a seven-year-old, it's boring. How come we have to walk from here to there? How come there's no marionette popping back and forth? Everything happens too slowly. And we first studied this with observational data some time ago, and we found, in fact, that the more television children watched before the age of three, the more likely they were to have attention problems at age seven. Note, I don't say ADHD. And we also found that the more cognitive stimulation children receive before the age of three, the less likely they were to have attention problems. We measured co cognitive stimulation by how often parents read to their child, sing to them, take them to museums, et cetera. In fact, each hour of TV resulted in a 10% increased risk of attentional problems later, meaning that a child who watched two hours of TV before the age of three would be 20% more likely to have attentional problems at age seven compared to one who watched none. And we also found that each hour of cognitive stimulation decreased the risk of attentional problems later. So if you will, these are two sides of the same coin. There are certain things we can do early in life that promote children's innate ability to focus, and there are certain things that we can do early on that impede it. Now, if that's true, then you might imagine that if the overstimulation hypothesis is true, you might imagine that what children watch matters, because not all programs, not all apps, not all any of the digital platforms we're going to be discussing today uh, are the same. So I want to give you two examples of content to make this distinction. The first is from the Powerpuff Girls movie. It's a little dated, I apologize. I don't know how many of you have seen this. But here's the opening sequence. Can we turn up the volume? Again, you'll notice that there's random uh, scene changes that are fairly rapid and completely discombobulated. In fact, this was the first movie that was ever rated PG for non-stop frenetic animated action. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That's the back of the box. I, I want to contrast that with something that I know you've all seen, and that's this. So here is a scene from Mr. Rogers. Can we turn it up? Can we turn it up the volume? Hi, Oz. Oh, hi. <laughs> are you Fred. I'm fine. How are you? Good, thanks. I brought my television neighbor to see what a restaurant was like. Oh, I'm so glad. Can I show you a table? Certainly. I'm awfully busy today. One of the waitresses is ill. I see. So I'm sort of doing double duty. How about this? This is fine. Thank Grand. you very much. Sit down, and I'll be right back. All right. Now, when you come to a restaurant, Usually somebody shows you what table you're supposed to sit at. And uh, one of the first things you do is to put your napkin either on your lap or up here. And then 
Well, this is the way a table is set. So Fred Rogers, God bless him, invented reality TV. He's not credited with it. <laughs> and actually, it's not reality, right? It's, if anything, it's, it's slower than reality. The waitress says, I'm awfully busy today, but she doesn't seem the least bit hairy. Uh, the pacing of this, if anything, is soothing and, and, and surreally slow, certainly by today's video standards and probably even by today's life standards. I've, I've never gone to a restaurant that seemed that calm, certainly not with my children. Um, and when we, re re when we repeated our study looking at what children watched and their risk of attentional problems, we saw that when they watched educational shows like Mr. Rogers, there was no increased risk in attentional problems. When they watched entertainment shows like the Powerpuff Girls movies, there was a 60% chance, increased chance of attentional problems. And when they watched violent shows like I didn't show you, but which are even typically more rapidly sequenced, there was an over 100% increased risk of having attentional problems later. So again, this further builds the argument that the content, that the pacing early in life is extremely important to the impact it has on children's brains. Now, there's a limit to what I can do with humans, thankfully, uh, because these are all observational studies. And of course, it would be unethical and impractical to, to overstimulate the minds of, of, of babies and follow them for years. So for the last uh, three years, uh, I've been collaborating with a colleague uh, in, at Seattle Children's Research Institute, and we've built a mouse model of overstimulation, which you're seeing here. So this is mouse, that's mouse TV, it's kind of annoying, but um, the way it works is that the, that the mice are put into these, if you will, TV lounges, and there is audio from the Cartoon Network, just to be cute, piped in, and then there are photorhythmic uh, sensors and lights that flash around, uh, simulating, if you will, audio-visual overstimulation. And starting at 10 days of life, we, over, we have them watch TV, really overstimulate them for six hours a day for 42 days. So these mice spend their entire childhood watching television. Not different from, from uh, a sizable percentage of, of children, unfortunately. And then 10 days later, we assess their behavior. And I'll show you some of the tests that we do and the results. So um, the first thing we do assesses activity and risk taking. And we do this using what's called the open field test. And the way this works is we put the mouse in a simulated open field. It's a black box. There's some black electrical tape, which is a little hard to see there in the middle. And um, if you put mice in open fields or in black boxes simulating open fields, they, uh, they have a tendency to stay around the perimeter. The reason being that uh, mice have very few friends in the natural world, and it's dangerous to go uh, into the middle. And yet they have a foraging instinct that will lead them to venture into an open field. But it's, it's a sign of, of, of anxiety uh, to avoid it. So we exploit the fact in this case that we have a white mouse on a black background. We have a computer tracker above this. And it can show us uh, how the mouse travels. And so here on the left, you see the pattern of a normal mouse, which is what you were looking at before, spending most of its time all around the perimeter. And if you look at this mouse, um, it's quite different. And there are two things that jump out at you. One, that it spends a lot of time, more time in the middle. But also, it's much more active. It's hyperactive, in fact, compared to this one. And what we found when we compared our control mice to overstimulated mice is just that. They, make the, they spend more time in their center, and they make more entries in the center. So they're hyperkinetic and less anxious, less risk averse, I should say. And now more recently, we've begun doing um, antibody staining of these mice's brains. And you can see here on the left, it's a little hard to see. These are control mice uh, at 125 days of life. And the little green dots that light up are neurogenesis, meaning that their brain cells are actually developing there. And if you look at the exposure males, uh, they're significantly fewer. This is just one slide, but obviously we quantified it. And I'll show you that on the next slide here. So I have three things here to show you. These are the control. This is the number of K KI67 stained cells in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a specific slice. These are infant overstimulated mice. You can see they're significantly lower. And then these are adult overstimulated mice. So we took adults and, and had them watch TV for the same period of time after the brains were developed. And you'll notice they're not different from control. So there's something uh, developmentally different about being overexposed or overstimulated early, at least in a mouse's life, uh, than later. Switching gears a little bit to talk about joint attention, which is part of, of what stimulates young children's development. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, in its simplest form, it's two people looking at something together. Um, 
but eventually it becomes dyadic and then triadic. And what I mean by that, beginning at about four to six months of age, uh, you can direct an infant's attention to something and they will look over to it and then they will automatically return their gaze to you, uh, implicitly asking, what is that? Tell me something about it. Why did you have me look at that? That happens uh, hundreds of times a day under normal circumstances and it's incredibly important, not just to children's cognition, to their social development, but to the architecture of their brains. Beginning at about nine to 12 months of age, children will initiate bids for joint attention. So this girl will point to something, mom will look at it, and then they'll look to each other and have a conversation about it. So a few years ago, we did a study to look at just this. How is joint attention impacted by media exposure? And we used the Lena system, something you all may be familiar with. It's a little digital language processor that is worn in a vest, and it records everything a child says or hears, everything that's audible at their chest. And the data are automatically analyzed by a software. Lena can decode adult word count, both male and female, child vocalizations, conversational turns, so this back and forth that I was just describing, and television, which when the Lena creators developed it, they viewed as being garbage. They wanted to separate that from these other things. And when I first learned that they had this software, this was five, six years ago, that was what I was most interested in, was the fact that they could actually detect background television. So we did a conditional regression analysis where each child served as their own control. And we basically compared times when they could hear a TV to times when they could not. And what we found was uh, each hour of audible TV resulted in them hearing 656 fewer adult female words. And each hour of audible TV resulted in them hearing 200 fewer adult male words. Now, how many words does a typical adult female say in an hour? No one wants to hazard a guess. She says 700, uh, 712 to be precise. There's about a 90% displacement in the number of adult female words that an infant hears when, they are, when, uh, when, they're, when their television is audible to them. Now, how many words does a typical adult male say in an hour? So it's not what you think. No one wants to go on record. It's not what you think. I've given this talk all over the world, and everybody in every culture fully assumes that uh, uh, men talk less than women. But in fact, a typical adult male says 714 words an hour, two words more uh, than, but not statistically significant. So men and women say the same number, they speak the same amount, doesn't mean they listen to each other. The reason, <laughs> the reason you see a difference here is not because men talk less, but because they talk less to babies than women do. So there's as much of a displacement proportionately, but not overall. The men in this case are talking to the television, not to the children. Okay, uh, some of the other things we've been doing in our lab, um, looking at neuroendocrine effects. So we've, some time ago now, I guess a couple years ago, we brought 49 infants into the lab and we randomized them to a half an hour of block play or uh, of watching a baby Einstein DVD and we collected serial uh, salivary cortisol, uh, which is very easy to do in infants. They love to donate their saliva, it's no problem. <laughs> and salivary cortisol actually is quite good. It lags about 20 minutes behind serum. And we, we looked to see what the, what the salivary cortisol levels were. Now, the, 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 the weird thing about cortisol, and we might be talking about it as a biomarker as we go forward, is that it has a very complicated relationship, frankly, with many things, including cognition. And we know from adults that there's really this sort of inverted U that high cortisol levels are associated with poor performance as are low ones. There's an optimal level of, if you will, stress. If you think of it as stress, I think of it more as a measure of cognitive engagement than, than actual stress. So the problem we had is we don't know what the right level of cortisol is for babies, which is why we randomized them to block play. We've done previous studies that showed that block play is associated with increased language. So the idea was how does the cortisol level observed with DVDs compare to blocks? And what we found was this, uh, briefly, because I need to wrap this up, um, that uh, 10 minutes into the activity, cortisol levels in the DVD group were almost statistically significantly lower not quite, there's the 95% there's confidence interval. 20 minutes into activity, they were significantly lower, and then at the conclusion of that activity, they returned to baseline. So there's, I'm moving along. All right, so I, <laughs> I did start late, and your introduction took a lot of time. So <laughs> April 3rd, 2010, I think that the landscape changed dramatically with the introduction of the iPad, and most of the research that I've shown you was with 
uh, passive use of media. And I think this was really a game changer. And I say this because what is the one thing a child never says or thinks when they're using old media? And the answer is, I did it. Because they don't do anything. They sit there passively and are exposed to it. Very, very different from the type of interaction, the type of experience they have with a touch screen. So I will go through this quickly. The question then might be, uh, how do we make sense of these new screens? Are they more like blocks or are they more like televisions? Well, let's look at a few features of these. I have here three things, a traditional toy, an iPad, and television. The first is reactivity. Does something you do, does something the child do invoke a reaction from the, from, the, from the device? Of course, Jack in the Boxes do do that. iPads do do that. Televisions don't. Are they interactive? Does the, what you do res result in a different kind of a, uh, reaction depending on what precisely you do? iPads do that, the other two don't. Is it tailorable? Does it, the experience differ depending on the child, on, on their own level of development? Is it progressive? Does it go from, the, the, each time you play it, does it take you a, in a different direction or in an, in an, uh, does it escalate in some way? Can it promote joint attention? I would say clearly traditional toys can. iPads certainly could theoretically promote joint attention that we talked about. Portability, and then finally three-dimensionality. So before you read this as a sign that iPads are so great, the simple act of reading to a child does all of these things and much more. So this, is not a, this checklist is by no means meant to somehow uh, put iPads on a pedestal. But I think we do have to think about what the horizon for these devices are and not think of them as, as two-dimensional screens that have very little to offer uh, and are, are really likable to television. So just a few images here. And, and, and I point to these last two in particular because one of the big gripes has been the two-dimensionality of the experience. And even that is changing and likely to change even more in the future. And as you get to this level, it's very hard to argue this is different than doing a puzzle. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, it might, might, I want to underline might, might have added value. Okay. I guess I'll just skip the rest of this. I apologize. <laughs> I only have three more slides. Okay, is that a sign that I could? All right. So I, wanted to, I, I do want to add this caveat. <laughs> All right. This, I, I think this is important, and I apologize, uh, because this, I think this is something we have to keep in mind. The, the VTA, this is a dopamine reward pathway in a, in a split second. The VTA sends a signal to nucleus accumbens, which is perceived as a reward, sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex. I like that. Get more of it. Do it again. Okay, the dopamine reward pathway reinforces all kinds of behaviors. The problem, the, at least the theoretical, and as you probably know, B.F. Skinner, if you were alive today, this is what he would be studying. <laughs> now, um, this infant here with these toys on their, on their high chair, I can guarantee you as a parent and as a pediatrician, he or she is going to take those and throw them down. Um, and the parent is going to pick those up and put them back. That is the dopamine reward pathway in a nutshell. The child delights at it. Why? Because it did something, made someone do something. It caused that reaction, and it can do it over and over, and, it, and they will. So, um, and that is a theoretical concern I have about iPads that, that really can become very, very addictive because it is so, such a rewarding experience for infants. All right, I am done. Thank you very, very much.